Hello and welcome back to English 332. In this uh, lecture, we're talking about the research for proposals and reports. In other words, the type of research uh, you might get up to, not as an academic, but as a professional writer or communicator in the workplace. And there's a lot of really fascinating aspects of this. It's, if it sounds boring, uh, don't worry, it will quickly get interesting. Uh, anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so let's get into it. All right, so here go our learning objectives for today. We'll be talking about the different types of reports that are out there, uh, how to define the report problems. Uh, so unlike uh, academic situations where you might just have to write something because the professor asks you to write it uh, or you need to write in order to get uh, publications or whatever, uh, in the business world, it's always uh, some kind of problem or opportunity has arisen uh, justifying that. Uh, writing and the research that goes into it. So we'll talk about those different kinds of problems. Uh, the different strategies you might take, uh, you might use, and there's a couple of them. And then uh, what about documenting sources? Do business writers use MLA, APA, Chicago, or none of the above? All right, first up, the, the steps. What are the steps involved in uh, writing a report? Uh, first, of course, is to define uh, the problem that the report addresses. They're not going to pay you uh, to take the time, and the resources to write up research and write a report if there's no justification for it, right? So what is the problem? And we've talked before in this class, uh, maybe there's a parking problem on campus. Seems like every college has a parking issue. Maybe there's not enough spaces. Uh, maybe the problem is a drop off in enrollment. Uh, moving into the business world, of course, all the stuff associated with your sales going up or down, new technologies coming out, uh, legal issues, I mean, you name it, there's an infinite number of these. All right, so once you define the problem, we'll talk about how to gather the data, make some kind of uh, intelligent decision based on it, how to analyze that data, because a lot of the times you might have data that seems to contradict itself, not necessarily a bad thing, as we'll get into. How to organize that information. Uh, again, you'll be presenting this report to somebody. <laughs> uh, they don't want to have to sift through the data themselves. That's why they've hired you to do it. Uh, so you need to organize it uh, in, in the best possible way for that audience. And then finally, of course, to actually write the report. Uh, that seems kind of... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> inevitable eventually you will have to write this interesting thing though about this uh, uh, in this context the report could be anything from a PowerPoint uh, to a, a memo uh, all the way up to like a formal scientific technical sounding report so lots of different options there all right so let's talk about these two basic categories of reports uh, the first is the uh, that they talk about is the formal formal report. This is probably what you have in mind when you hear about uh, business reports, right? And they have uh, these certain elements that make them formal. Uh, one, of course, the title page. Uh, you basically want this to look professional. And the title page is important uh, for not only just to establish your credibility as a professional, but also to give the uh, reader a clear indication of what is in that report. Uh, so usually these will not be very cleverly <laughs> clever titles, puns, or anything like that. It'll be very matter of fact, uh, so that the uh, person will know whether that report applies to them, whether it's relevant. Uh, the transmittal, uh, this if you're faxing this, I guess even if you email it, it might have information about uh, that procedure. Uh, back in the day, uh, this was a bigger step because the people on the other end of a fax machine had to decide whether it was worth the cost of, uh, you know, uh, downloading and printing out maybe a couple hundred page document. Uh, so this transmittal form was just telling them what the document was so they could make that decision. They could decide, no, we, we, don't, we won't accept this, this fax or we, or we will. Of course, the table of contents and the list of illustrations, uh, this is assuming, of course, it's a, a lengthy report. And then more common than the formal ones are, of course, the informal ones. So this could be the little memos that go around an office, uh, maybe a letter that goes outside the office, uh, probably more likely these days an email, uh, some type of data. 
sales figures, stuff like that. But basically, it's, it doesn't need to be um, uh, super <laughs> articulate, I guess. Or, uh, they don't expect you to spend a whole lot of time working on the wording of these things. It's, it's, it's for less important uh, communications, I guess you could say, or at least uh, communications where it's not so important about the perception. Uh, now we get into the types of or classes of reports, uh, and this is useful to keep in mind. So the first one is just an informational report, and so there's not really supposed to be an op opinion attached to this. It's just, uh, you know, what is the information? So let's say you're working for uh, some type of farm farm company, and they say we want to. We, we've heard about these new combine harvesters. <laughs> you know, can you tell us what's all out there and how you know, the capabilities of the machines, the cost of each machine and so on uh, and you would just present that information you wouldn't have necessarily a, uh, a recommendation there uh, they give the examples of sales reports quarterly reports uh, so again this is just the information it's just the facts uh, there's no real need here to spin these <laughs> matter of fact you'd probably want to do the opposite of spin uh, you just want the the, the data right uh, then we get into the next step of this, which would be the analytical uh, step. So you're doing some kind of interpretation of the data. Maybe you're simplifying it. Maybe you're organizing it in a, in a better way. Uh, but what you're not doing yet is recommending something. So coming back to the tractor example again, uh, maybe you've uh, organized these uh, tractor or combine harvesters. <laughs> you've organized these combine harvesters into different categories. Uh, different price points, uh, whatever. You're, you're kind of digging in deeper into what the uh, these different features mean and so on and so forth, but still not quite uh, recommending yet. An the example, they give you uh, an annual annual report. So the other one was just for the quarter, right? So there's only uh, there's four of them uh, over the year. This would be the sort of summary report. Uh, so you probably want to do a little analysis there got a lot more data to work with over the course of a whole year uh, than you would just in a quarter. Uh, audit reports, uh, make good or payback reports. Uh, this one was kind of interesting. So if you have, uh, if your company has bought some new equipment, maybe they invested in that equipment with the idea that it would pay for itself, uh, you know, after such and such a time. Uh, so that that's that what this report is about, you know, has it or has it not? <laughs> and you could analyze that. And then finally, the recommendation report, as this is where you are recommending the action, or if you have the problem, a, a particular solution. And they break these into feasibility reports. In other words, what's feasible or what's what's really within the realm of possibility. If you say something's infeasible, uh, you mean what you're basically saying it's impractical, it's too expensive, it'll take too long, uh, something like that. There's some reason, good reasons why it can't be done. If it's feasible, uh, that means it can it can be done. It might be costly or whatever, but you can do it. And this is what this report is about, right? Are you recommending that it's uh, feasible or not? Uh, justification reports, uh, just like it sounds, right? Is it justified? <laughs> uh, do uh, are the uh, extra costs of this particular model? Does it justify? Uh, do the features on it justify the increased uh, price? And then, of course, the problem solving uh, reports. So you have raised a problem, you have your solution. And like we talked about uh, previously, you have to show how your solution is the best. And now they simply are saying here on this slide that a lot of the times it won't be strictly informational, strictly analytical. A lot of the times it will be some combination of these. And they get some examples here. Accident reports, you might have been in the unfortunate situation. Maybe you had a little car accident, hopefully nothing serious, maybe a fender bender. Uh, but you had to fill out one of these accident reports, or at least uh, seen them. Uh, so, you know, there's a, a mixture of these things, right? There'll be some just data, like the time and the place it occurred, uh, some analysis, you know, who, what caused the accident, and then the recommendations. Maybe they've um, uh, found you liable. Uh, <laughs> uh, who knows, right? Maybe the other person is liable. Uh, credit reports, you've probably gotten them before. Uh, it's just all the credit card information, your history of paying the bills, the rent, 
uh, are you behind on things you got that sort of uh, basic facts uh, some analysis and then of course the recommendation is whether uh, it's a score the credit score right and that score is about it's basically a recommendation to either give you a loan or deny you that loan and the rest of these is very similar uh, progress reports you know is things progressing or are they not uh, trip reports if you're on the company dime and you go off to, to a conference a convention <laughs> oftentimes want to know uh, was it worth it uh, did you learn something valuable there uh, did you make some new connections uh, whatever uh, closure reports uh, this one is um, well, let's see what what is this one <laughs> uh, closure reports present data analysis and recommendation for action all in one report uh, so this last one i guess is the a sort of final report where you bring everything together now, i would assume this you'd write one of these if it was some on lengthy project maybe three or four years in development right uh, okay all right defining the report topics and the first step here is to identify a real problem uh, again somebody maybe you're contracting uh, your services uh, there are a lot of companies out there that's their uh, raise on debt right is to try to sell the, their services to other companies and they'll say that look uh, you have this problem <laughs> we'd like to look into it for you maybe it's a telecommunications problem maybe it's an information security problem I know a lot of you folks are into uh, data security information technologies and so that might be your business model right you find a company that you feel like uh, they have some possible uh, exploits there in their system so you could say that look you've got a problem you you're running this old version of windows maybe they're, maybe they're on windows 95 and they're they don't have any virus software whatever but it's a what i'm trying to get at here is you need to convince them this is a real problem right and they say a uh, narrow but challenging uh, so some of the examples they gave uh, you wouldn't want to write or say the problem was something to do with college students in general uh, there's just too many different colleges too many universities private public it's just too big now, if you look at one institution uh, then you're kind of narrowing it down but it's not it's still going to provide useful information uh, and then of course the real audience so again unlike the academic exercises you do uh, this will have you're writing this you're not just writing this report for uh, uh, for fun or to get, to get a grade or whatever uh, but you're writing it to someone uh, maybe to a company management supervisor uh, small business manager whatever and they're, they're able to uh, able to do the recommended actions so again if you're advising them hey you need to upgrade your windows your telecommunications infrastructure whatever uh, they that person that you're writing the report for that committee team whatever uh, they have to actually be able to implement it otherwise uh, what's the point uh, some more information about this uh, the data uh, evidence and the facts that you present there uh, if you're saying this is a problem uh, they're not just going to take your word for it right uh, you need to convince them so you might have some uh, information there about similar companies that didn't upgrade their uh, infrastructure and maybe there was a breach and it cost them millions of dollars and a huge blow to their uh, brand reputation you've know, got the whole target i remember target not too long ago had this uh, security breach uh, so you could find lots of data evidence and, and facts uh, again not just opinions <laughs> uh, that could really show somebody kind of wake them up right and say whoa okay yeah this is serious we need to get on this and upgrade our our uh, uh, infrastructure right so conveying the severity of the problem uh, and then the second thing is you might not have thought as much about it. okay maybe you say yeah look target uh, who else uh, has been involved in these uh, breaches seems like <laughs> uh, was it facebook and their cambridge something about cambridge analytics uh, i don't pretend to understand everything about it uh, but anyway it would be relatively easy to convince the people yeah look there's a real serious issue with security information security right now that's easy enough uh, the second step is a little harder uh, so you have your solution your recommendation how can you show that that will solve it uh, so this is about old uh, zuckerberg's having to do right he's, he keeps saying that oh facebook we're rolling out these new 
algorithms and it's going to uh, filter out the uh, propaganda and somehow uh, not restrict free speech. <laughs> and so a lot of these, uh, a lot of senators, I guess, right, whoever's on that committee is kind of grilling them on this and saying, look, how do you know that's going to solve the problem? Maybe it might actually create more problems than it solves. Uh, so there you go, it's a real life example of where somebody, a very powerful person, is having to prove uh, they have a recommendation and it will solve it. Maybe they won't be able to prove that. Uh, of course, available to the person writing the document, uh, can you get at the data? Uh, let's come back to this. Let's say you don't work for Facebook. Let's say you're your, your independent company. Uh, will you be able to get the data uh, from Facebook that you would need uh, to solve that security problem? It might not be available to you. They might just say, no, you can't have it. A lot of times this happens uh, with sales information. Companies don't want to just share uh, their sales information, how they're doing. <laughs> Sometimes they have to, uh, but they certainly aren't going to give you stuff that could damage them if they don't have to, right? So whether it's available to you, and this could even get into like the Sunshine Laws, Freedom of Information Act, all that um, stuff. We don't really have time to get into here. And then finally, is it comprehensible to you? So I can imagine... Uh, you get this information, it's too technical, right? Now, this Facebook algorithm, if, if I looked at it, I probably wouldn't be able to, only, maybe I have like a basic understanding of how it, how it would work, but it's really probably would be incomprehensible uh, to me. So that would be an issue. Even if they handed it over, uh, it still might be uh, incomprehensible to me. Uh, so these are all uh, issues. All right, so the purpose statement uh, of your problem uh, report should do three things. Uh, again, the organizational problem or conflict that it's dealing with. Uh, the specific technical questions that must be answered to uh, solve the problem. And a lot of times, uh, just getting these questions right is the key. Uh, we talked before about the whole elevator and mirror situation. So really, that was just a matter of asking the right question. It wasn't, how do we make the elevators go faster? Uh, the question was, how do we reduce the uh, number of complaints uh, coming in about uh, the elevators? So nailing that question helped solve the problem in a much better way. Uh, rhetorical purpose, the report is designed to achieve. Uh, so what this is talking about here is uh, there's some kind of persuasion going on there. Uh, again, the usually most problems have multiple solutions, and sometimes it's not really clear. Should you go with this solution? Should you go with this other solution? And there's some persuasion that has to go on because, you know, especially if you're the company providing uh, solution A, uh, you want to convince them or, or use rhetoric uh, to show that, yes, you are the, you, your solution is the better one. Uh, they should go with you. That could be the rhetorical purpose of that report. So yes, it's informational. Yes, it's analytical. Yes, you're making a recommendation. Is it completely unbiased? <laughs> uh, I don't even know what that, if that's even possible, right? You always have some kind of rhetorical purpose, especially if you're the company providing the service. I mean, come on. Uh, you want them to uh, look at your recommendation. Oh, what is this? Explain, recommend, request, and propose. All right, getting into the types of research, uh, just like in academic research, you have primary and secondary. Uh, the primary research is to gather the new data. How do you get data in a business context? One, of course, is surveys, and you see these everywhere, online surveys. And this is uh, this is where the lecture, I think, is really going <laughs> to start getting interesting. Because man, the ways they can spin, and manipulate the data, on these surveys. It is just <laughs> uh, amazing. Uh, but anyway, you've seen those. Uh, less common, I think, are interviews. So if you, you might go in and um, a lot of the times these companies want to interview uh, the politicians, the senator, state senator, whatever. Just sit them down, talk to them, figure out what their position is on something. Uh, you might have been interviewed before. Sometimes they 
course, at a job, you know, think about a job interview, right? That's what they're uh, they're doing. They're gathering data on you. <laughs> and a lot of times, uh, the resume is not sufficient, right? They want to sit down with you and see if they can uh, learn some things that's not obvious. Now, my favorite of these actually is the uh, observation. Uh, we'll get into this, but a lot of times this other stuff is almost irrelevant because what you say tends to be much different than what you do. Uh, so, for example, on Netflix surveys, I remember reading this as part of my research, they found that most people when asked would say, yes, I watch a lot of documentaries. I love those <laughs> educational programs. Uh, that's why I spend most of my time watching. Of course, that was what the, they might have wanted to, themselves to, they might have wanted to think of themselves as that way, that kind of a snobbish elite uh, cultural, uh, you know, somebody, somebody smart and intelligent. <laughs> but of course, Netflix, uh, they have the data, right? They, they can go in and see, like, what did you watch? Uh, and they found, of course, that people watch all the, you know, mainstream stuff, the uh, basically fast food, <laughs> not the, not the meaty stuff. So yeah, that, that was the observation. Uh, secondary research retrieves information someone else gathered, right? So uh, not, a lot of times you won't have the resources to conduct a big survey, to do interviews, to do observations, but uh, you can access this. And this one here is another reason why Facebook is in the, the news so often, because they have all this information they've accumulated. And of course, all these people making apps and companies and uh, all these, they want to retrieve that information, right? They want to use uh, what Facebook or Google, uh, uh, Twitter, whatever. They want to ret they want access to that information because uh, they uh, that'll save them a lot of trouble. Oh, library research. Now you might not you might think, well, once I'm once I'm out of here, <laughs> you'll never catch me in a library. <laughs> uh, maybe maybe not. Uh, what you probably will use is the uh, online library functions. A lot of these companies will have access to one of these uh, business databases. They mention a couple. Uh, online searches, though, of course, still be useful. And you want to think beyond uh, Google. A lot of people, they just use Google. They don't realize that there's all these uh, more specialized search engines. And there's really, there's too many for me to get into here. And they, it just depends on what uh, company you're in or what type of business you're in. Uh, but you should learn about the other ones besides just Google. All right, so here's one of my uh, favorite topics, the criteria for evaluating web sources. And I've found, just as an educator, that most of my students really struggle with this, right? They, they, they um, you know, I'll give them an, an article from The Onion, uh, a parody website. And they'll and they'll just assume it's legitimate, even though it's uh, to me it's uh, it's kind of hilarious topics, <laughs> pretty far out stuff. But uh, the Onion uh, does a really good job of making themselves look like a credible news site, and you know you can sort of see how somebody could be duped by it, especially if I just if I presented it to you as fact, uh, you might not think to question it. And unfortunately, it's that way with uh, most. Well, I don't know about most, but. Uh, Lots and lots of uh, websites are either just flat out fake or they're heavily biased or heavily selective. And uh, there's just all sorts of reasons that you should be uh, skeptical. Uh, just because you see it on the web does not make it so. And you, you see this all the time uh, on Facebook even. And don't feel bad about this, by the way. I have plenty of uh, professor colleagues who will uh, be on Facebook and they'll see one of those memes. It looks... It looks like it's uh, trustworthy information, and they'll forward it. They'll, they'll share it, right? Just because it, if it, especially if it clicks with their political views, let's say, uh, they will just spam that, share it, and uh, pass it on as legitimate. And then eventually somebody will say, "Hey, look, uh, you might want to check the Snopes.com." Uh, Snopes is a site that uh, reports on these um, uh, fake news, I guess, or <laughs> hoaxes. That's the word, hoax. Uh, and then they'll say, oh, crap. <laughs> I probably should have done a little looking around before I posted that. 
Uh, but anyway, this is uh, some general criteria we can use so you can avoid that, that problem. Now, uh, the first step is uh, to look at the who wrote the piece. And uh, frequently I get students asking me this question. They'll say, well, look, I want to use this web article, this web page. And I know I'm supposed to mention the author, but it's not on there anywhere. I don't know who wrote this. <laughs> and then I ask them, well, how, how should that affect your evaluation? Would you, do you think it's credible uh, that, that there's no author there, that there's no organization affiliated with it, that you don't know where it came from? <laughs> to me, uh, that would make me very skeptical. Like, wow, I would probably want to steer clear of that. Um, uh, maybe there's a good reason they didn't put their name on it, uh, right? Uh, but we could find uh, other sources of bias. Uh, if I'm doing an article about, uh, you know, if I'm looking for information about, say, uh, uh, animal rights issues, right, and all my sources are from the Humane Society or from PETA, uh, that's, you know, it's not saying that that information is wrong, but I should expect it to be heavily biased. Uh, yeah, so what person or organization sponsors the site? Uh, if you're in a company, coming back to our combine harvesters thing, <laughs> and your website was uh, John Deere, well, wouldn't you expect that to be biased towards the uh, uh, John Deere products, of course. Uh, what credentials does the author have? And of course, here we get it. You could get into the, the, the pseudoscience. <laughs> uh, really and truly, anybody can call themselves doctor. Oh, I'm doctor so and so. And you should listen to what I have to say about these uh, mystical soaps. <laughs> Actually, it was at the craft festival a couple of years ago, and there was a booth there. It was a Nigerian soaps. And the guy there was claiming to be this doctor. Dr. So-and-so, and he was saying, look, these soaps, and he had this huge list of stuff the soap would cure, and it even included cancer. He said, if you use this soap, uh, it will even cure cancer. You, know, you can trust me, I'm Dr. So-and-so. <laughs> now, I didn't bother to look at this person's credentials, but assuming that he wasn't just lying about this, uh, you can get this a fake doctorate really easily, or the doctorate might not even have anything to do with that field. I mean, I've got a doctorate in uh, English, right? But I could just say, well, I'm Dr. Barton. Uh, you know, here's my soap. <laughs> uh, and you could be fooled by that. And plus, there's all these other organizations out there that have, uh, you know, the grant doctorates in uh, ridiculous fields. Uh, but anyway, the point here is just simply, is the person legitimately an expert? Uh, do they have a good reputation among uh, other experts? Uh, sometimes this can work in reverse. Uh, you might have somebody that uh, maybe they do know what they're talking about, right? But they have such a bad reputation, uh, people don't listen. Uh, objectivity, right? This is getting into the, the bias. Uh, so just because it's a John Deere site, uh, that's not to say that this bunch of uh, made-up garbage, right? right? They probably have uh, some facts on the site. They wouldn't just outright lie. <laughs> And we would hope. Uh, but nevertheless, we could look at we could get into it. Like, does it give evidence to support the claims? Uh, so if they say this one combine harvester is better than uh, the others on the market. Well, that's just them saying that, right? But what is their evidence? Do they have any data to back it up? Uh, does it give both sides of the issue? Right? A lot of times uh, people want to skip this step. Uh, you'll notice uh, the medical industry, the pharmaceutical industry, by law, they have to tell you about the side effects. Now, if they didn't have to do that, they probably wouldn't. And then you would just think, well, this product is totally harmless. Uh, that would be uh, <laughs> bad for you, uh, more than likely. Uh, and then is the tone professional? You could look at it and say, does it, if it's full of errors, if it seems uh, really full of slang, <laughs> you know, that could be a sign that maybe it's not. Although with this one, I, th I think you have to take this one very carefully uh, because, again, uh, one of the ways people are fooled by hoaxes and bad websites and just outright lies is that they, uh, it, they won't have, it's not like it'll be full of errors and look bad, look amateurish. 
a lot of times these things will look very professional and you think wow this looks like a you know top quality website uh, so even if it sounds professional it, it might not be because uh, a lot of these professional hoaxers and <laughs> con artists are really good at uh, passing themselves off as professionals uh, so some more information about <laughs> the information now how complete uh, is the information uh, so they, they go into detail about all the facets uh, they list all the side effects uh, for example in the pharmaceutical industry uh, do they provide the information about the com com competitors uh, that sort of thing uh, what's it based on uh, so you can look at their how do they accumulate their information right is it all surveys is it all uh, secondhand research is it just based on uh, Wikipedia? Uh, currency, basically how recent is their information? Uh, you can think about uh, information security, data security, that sort of thing. Uh, something from even a couple of years ago is probably already obsolete. Right? So you have to have absolutely cutting edge uh, currency uh, for that report to be trusted. Uh, the audience, so if you find... Uh, a report written for the management of such and such a company uh, that might be tailored for them but it might not apply very well to or, uh, to your needs yeah who is the intended audience of that information uh, it's always like to play around with this one in, in, in rhetoric classes uh, so you see the same politician <laughs> if they're talking to this uh, union of workers uh, for a factory uh, they'll have one uh, one uh, might, might be the same information, but they're spinning it one way for them. And then you flip it around. Now they're talking to bankers and investors, and they got a completely different spin on it. Uh, again, it doesn't necessarily that they're lying. Uh, it's just that they have adapted that information for those different audiences. And if I want to be able to make any kind of sense of it, I have to know, well, who was, who were they addressing it to here? Who were they addressing in this other situation? Uh, I have to know that uh, to be able to evaluate it. All right, now we're getting into surveys, questionnaires, and interviews, and asking which is appropriate for which situation. And the survey, obviously, it's good for a larger group of people. So you, you want to get lots of different people, hopefully a wide variety of the type of people that would be relevant, you know, the people buying <laughs> combine harvesters, for example. Uh, if you're a politician uh, running for office, you probably want to know, you probably want to hear from, um, you know, people that might, uh, people that uh, are in your district, right? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, that would be good for a survey. Uh, the questionnaire is a little bit more involved because it's questions for people to fill out. So uh, instead of just saying, you know, rate this on a scale of one to five, uh, rate this on a scale of one to five, uh, yes or no kind of questions. Now, the questionnaire might just say something like, uh, might have a question there. Uh, what, what are some problems you perceive in, the, in your community? <laughs> or or what, are your, what are your priorities for blah, blah, blah? And so they actually, actually fill out some answers, short answers. And then finally, the interview, of course, you've seen these. Uh, they call it here a structured conversation, which sounds kind of nice. So it might sound like it's, they just sat down and just started talking. Uh, but, of course, uh, they have actually prepped for this quite a bit. Usually they have the questions in advance to be thinking about, getting their, their talking points together. Uh, but the purpose of it is is to just quickly gather information, again, from someone who has it. So I, I'll, I'll watch a lot of news, and you see these all the time, right? They'll have, um, sometimes they have professors on. <laughs> I always dread it when the professors go on there because they're usually, I don't know where they find these people. Uh, but uh, ostensibly they're there because they're an expert in the uh, subject matter some type of economist or whatever and uh, they're able to uh, just give that information that you know as a professor they're trained to do this right take this complicated stuff break it down for a uh, non-expert at least that's uh, the idea and it's quicker to do that over with an interview than it would be uh, just reading about it all right so here's a topic that i think if you watch the news at all, uh, you have uh, been confronted with numerous times. And that's uh, what to make of these surveys that come out all the time. They'll say, well, somebody's approval ratings are up. 
maybe they're down. Uh, surveys about what people think about particular issues. Uh, it, it could be something like that. Of course, in the business world, we have uh, surveys about from customers, right, and, and uh, companies, and, and, and uh, safety of products, and it goes on and on. Uh, but obviously, you don't want to just say, well, the survey said, this survey says uh, this, so we need to go with that. No, uh, you want to question it. You want to be skeptical of it, uh, at least in, at first. Uh, so the first question you should always ask is, who did the survey and then who paid for it? Uh, so two related questions. Uh, so it could be the survey was done by a professional company, right, or maybe a university even. You say, well, that seems okay. Uh, but then you find out it was sponsored by uh, one of the companies involved in making the, the product, right? So we see countless examples of things related to tobacco and dangers of secondhand smoke and whatnot. And you find out, oh, look, this study said that there's no danger of secondhand smoke. Oh, that's great. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> it was uh, sponsored by Philip Morris. You know, the same thing with, uh, you could look at the, all this uh, stuff about organic foods and GMOs and all this, and they'll maybe you find out, uh, maybe a survey says it's really dangerous, uh, the GMOs, you should avoid those foods. And you find out, well, that study was sponsored by uh, <laughs> uh, Whole Foods. So, uh, let's say, I'm just making stuff up. Uh, but you get the idea, uh, right? Who did it? Maybe this, maybe this is a very amateurish outfit, or maybe it's just kind of a propaganda wing. Uh, that could be the who, and you could rule it out on that basis. Or it could be a legitimate company, but uh, they got bought off, basically. All right, so assuming that it's credible people that did the survey, uh, maybe it was paid for by the government or some other organization that, you know, let's just say you're not worried about who paid for it. Uh, next step is how did they collect the people uh, that they surveyed? How do, how do they choose those people? First of all, how many people? Uh, so if I'm making a statement like, well, you know, the people of Minnesota uh, uh, say that there should be no drilling, no more pipelines or whatever, uh, you know, according to my survey. So <laughs> first question you could say, well, how many people did you uh, survey? I say, well, I, I interviewed, or I surveyed three of my neighbors, right? <laughs> well, obviously that's not enough people to be representative of the state of Minnesota, right? I need to have many more uh, people. Uh, how were they chosen? So maybe I just went to this uh, protest rally against the pipelines and I talked to people there. Uh, well, again, uh, heavily biased study. Uh, how was the survey conducted? Right, so most of the, I remember some surveys I've done. Uh, one incident that really sticks out in my mind, I was at this uh, uh, car repair place and they repaired my car, and then the guy came over and asked if I'd like to fill out a survey about the uh, the service, and he just stood there. <laughs> he kind of handed me the pencil and just stood there watching me fill out the survey. Uh, now, was I going to put on there, it's, it was terrible service <laughs> right in front of the guy? <laughs> uh, of course not. So really, the results of that were uh, totally bogus. Uh, they... You know, I don't know who, whose idea it was uh, for him to be standing there like that, but it was uh, really just a terrible uh, project. And they find things like this. The book talks about a couple of examples, like the phone surveys, uh, the type of people that will pick up the phone when they don't know who it is and had they have nothing better to do than stay there on the line uh, for 20, 30 minutes uh, doing a survey. Uh, that's not just your average person, all right? That's a... <laughs> <laughs> a special kind of person. And so you can see how that's going to lead to different results. You're not really getting that uh, on that random sample that way. Uh, another factor is uh, what was uh, the response rate? Uh, so the if you're doing some type of, uh, they talked about the census. I thought this was interesting. Uh, so really by law, you're required to fill out that census information. If you don't, you're breaking the law. Uh, but they said even with that, it's only like 60% of people actually uh, respond to it. <laughs> so that's kind of weird to think about that. Uh, you know, 40% of people are breaking the law, I guess, by not uh, completing the survey. Uh, but anyway, you could look at that information, obviously, and see, uh, well, if, 
you know, if 60% of people didn't respond, uh, there might have been a good reason uh, that they didn't respond. And, and that should be factored in uh, to whether you, uh, you know, take this uh, survey at face value or not. Uh, what questions uh, were asked? And a lot of times uh, the way that questions are phrased uh, makes a huge difference. Uh, I remember hearing about one survey and they were asking about uh, something about Antifa. And they just said something like, do you support the actions of Antifa? Uh, something like that. And a lot of people didn't even know what Antifa was. <laughs> uh, so they would just uh, say no or maybe or yes. They, basically, they didn't know what the heck they were being asked. Uh, whereas where they, where they spelled out, where they defined the group or mentioned what it was about, uh, they might respond differently. And, you know, and same things with uh, phrases like Black Lives Matter. You know, if that's part of the question, uh, that's going to skew the results because people will have kind of a knee-jerk reaction uh, to that. Uh, whereas if you just said something like, uh, what are your thoughts? Uh, you know, do you agree that, uh, that uh, people should be treated fairly before the law? <laughs> And left out the uh, uh, sort of uh, keywords there, or the stuff that's likely to elicit that emotional reaction, uh, you might get a different set of uh, answers for that. So it's not, this is all vital stuff. So what questions were asked? Uh, how many people responded? How many people didn't? Maybe if it's a high rejection rate, why? Uh, how was the survey conducted? All this stuff will factor into it. And the point of all this is, you might be in a situation where you're arguing against somebody that's got all the survey data that they're using for their argument. So you could go in there and tear them apart with this stuff, right? Say, look, <laughs> you're alleging uh, th this, uh, this survey has accurate results. Look, <laughs> the company, look at the company that did the survey, <laughs> you know, and on down the line and, and shed significant uh, doubt over the uh, validity of that. All right, let's get a little bit more into the uh, survey questions. What do we mean, good, good question, bad question? Uh, you know, what are the details? Uh, one thing, of course, is to ask only one thing. Uh, you don't want these questions to have uh, to be actually bringing up a number of points because they, they still have to put it on a scale or say yes or no to it. And if you got multiple things you're asking about, it's very confusing uh, as to how to answer it. Uh, phrasing them neutrally, uh, another key thing, if you can think about a survey that just, if it said something like, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, uh, pollution of our rivers by uh, such and such company? <laughs> uh, well, obviously, that's going, nobody's going to say they support pollution, uh, so you've already taken a stance on it for them. I mean, the idea behind these surveys ought to be that you're trying to get their position and, and you don't want to let them in on what your position is because then they might uh, decide, well, they might just decide, well, this is a, a liberal survey or conservative survey, so I'm just not even going to do it and reject it. Uh, or they might uh, try to please you by giving you the response they think you want to hear. Uh, so all of this is why this one's so, uh, you have to be careful with that one. Uh, even the order of the questions can influence the answer. So they give the example in the book I thought was interesting. Uh, when they're asking about a president's, you hear about the president's approval rating is 40%, 60%. You know, you hear that all the time. And they, well, they in the book, they were talking about how those uh, results can be skewed by if they ask a lot of questions before they get to the approval question. Like, what are your thoughts on the economy? How do you think the, are you doing better now than you were four years ago, economically speaking? Yes or no? So they found if they ask a bunch of questions like that first, if the economy was doing great, uh, then when people got down to that approval question, they would say, yeah, he's doing a great job. Or, uh, she's doing a great job. Uh, if, on the other hand, uh, the economy was in the tank, <laughs> by the time they got to that approval question, they would say no. Now, if they asked the approval question first, though, uh, they got different results. Uh, so it's the order matters. Uh, avoid making assumptions about uh, the respondent. All right. So, yeah, you say, well, we can't trust that person. That person's a Republican. That person is a, is clearly liberal or whatever. 
you don't know that. These are just numbers on, this is just data. <laughs> so uh, don't make all these assumptions. Uh, mean the same thing uh, to different people. Uh, so the qual here, the problem here is that they were talking about some different cultures and different uh, ways we can interpret even words, right? Uh, we had the, the Black Lives Matter, for example. Uh, that clearly means uh, doesn't mean the same thing to different people. People will some people will think it's great, some people not so great. Uh, it has a diverge, divergent. Uh, meaning right so you want to find if you really want to be get this objective as possible survey now you have to make sure that you're using words that everybody agrees on again avoiding those knee-jerk emotional reactions to things uh, try to find the most neutral sounding way <laughs> to, uh, to word the questions uh even things like the word choice uh, i noticed i was watching a, a little report about these uh, Anyway, I won't go into it, uh, but they had the the word choice on the survey in conjunction to an issue, <laughs> and they found that just put that word choice could have a very different meaning for people. Uh, for one people, it was all about freedom, right? The freedom to choose. Uh, for the other other people, they would see the same word, uh, for, but for them, it had very sinister connotations to it. I got into uh, religious differences and, and all this other stuff. So I don't know if you can ever truly uh, write your questions in a way that will mean the same thing to different people, but the point is to at least try, and at least uh, try to avoid the uh, blatant uh, uh, conflicts, I guess, in, in inherent in some word choices. All right, one of the types of questions you might see on a survey, uh, probably the most common is the closed question. Right, so it'll say, uh, maybe you have a question on there. What did you think of today's lecture? One <laughs> liked it, didn't like it, hated it. Uh, so you have to select one of those possible responses. There's no way to like write in uh, another response. Uh, the open question is where you just ask, I just, just, maybe I just ask, what did you think of today's lecture? And then there's a, a box and you can type in your answer. Right, so I don't know what you're gonna type. I could get a hundred different uh, responses and everybody it's very doubtful that even two people will write exactly the same sentence uh, they'll be all over the place and that's one reason why this open one is not so popular because you get you know if I've done 10,000 uh, surveys and 10,000 responses come back and they're all open questions uh, then that's going to take a long time to go through all of those and try to make some kind of a sense of what what it means uh, whereas the closed questions the computer could do that in seconds Another pos another popular uh, strategy is the branching question. Uh, so that just means if you, you could say something like, uh, uh, have you used uh, SESU's uh, uh, career services <laughs> before? Yes or no? And it might say, if no, uh, then skip down to question 12 or 13, right? Because all this stuff won't pertain to you. And it's getting, getting easier to do these kind of branching questions online. Uh, these days and it can save people a lot of time and it's very useful uh, obviously the multiple choice questions uh, these are what you're probably familiar with from school right you have uh, mutually exclusive and exhaustive answers uh, so you've probably taken a test before and you had like a b c or d right but maybe the professor the teacher didn't do a really good job with those answers and maybe a couple of the you might be looking at two of the answers there and you think, you know, it could be either one of those. <laughs> uh, these are too close. Uh, it's a little bit of A, a little bit of B, and maybe there's not an option for all of the above or whatever. Uh, that's just kind of a bad question. Uh, it really should have answers that are mutually exclusive, meaning that uh, they don't overlap at all. Uh, so you say, uh, you know, five plus three, <laughs> is, it, <laughs> is it eight, is it nine? Is it 10? <laughs> uh, those are mutually exclusive. It can't be both of those. Uh, probes. Uh, so these are follow-up questions. Uh, so this, you probably wouldn't see this on the survey, more likely the, uh, the interview. Uh, so if, if you tell the maybe, the, maybe you're at a job interview and they ask you, uh, tell me about your previous job. <laughs> you start talking 
and you have your answer and then they might follow up with another question they might say well why did you leave that job if you liked it so much right so they're kind of probing in trying to get deeper uh, you see this on the news all the time these talk shows right they keep trying to get beyond the sort of talking point memorized answer and a lot of these uh, crummy politicians anyway they, they can't do it they just keep giving the same old talking memorized uh, talking point even when the person keeps trying to probe them and it makes them look bad makes them look really fake uh, the mirror questions uh, paraphrasing the content of the last answer so exactly how it sounds right if, they, if you say uh, uh, well I was uh, oh, while I was at uh, Electrolux in St. Cloud <laughs> I worked on the uh, particle accelerator there oh you worked on the particle accelerator you know, tell me more about that all right so you're just kind of taking that uh, what they said kind of putting it in your own words and putting it back at them And now are the sample types. Uh, so the uh, you say that my the, uh, for the survey to be credible, uh, you have to say it's it's a sample. Obviously, I'm not going to go out and survey every Minnesotan. That's just not feasible. Uh, so I have to select a group, uh, a sample basically of so many people uh, that would be supposed to represent or be enough like everybody else uh, that I can make some inferences based on that uh, data I collect. So how do I uh, do this? And they give you a couple of uh, possibilities here. One is the convenient sample, just like it sounds. It's like people that are convenient. Uh, a lot of times when I give students surveys to do, I want them to do a survey. Well, they'll just uh, survey other students at the university, right? Or their parents or their family or coworkers. Uh, just because those people are around, uh, they'll probably agree because they're your friend. <laughs> But obviously, you could see how that wouldn't be necessarily good because your sample will be very selective. Uh, the judgment sample, uh, these are people who uh, seem to have some knowledge on it, some interesting views on it. So coming back to our combine harvester example, uh, you might just talk to some of the farmers around uh, the state right, and ask them, uh, what brand do they go with? Uh, which model <laughs> do they find useful? And they're not just regular old folks. You know, it wouldn't be like person on the street wouldn't know what a combine harvester was. Uh, so you're finding people that are seem to have some expertise in it, right? Some experience with it. Uh, this this one, by the way, is why so many commercials will say uh, eight or nine doctors recommend uh, this product. All right, that's the idea. Is it's not just eight or nine people recommend it, but doctors, you know, people that whose judgment. Uh, seems just to be good and then finally the sort of gold standard I guess is the random sample uh, so you have uh, you figure out what the demographics are of Minnesota let's say and you have members enough of members of those different uh, categories to where you feel like you can you can legitimately say uh, this is how people in Minnesota feel about this topic uh, we have uh, randomly sampled people so we didn't choose people based on what we thought they would say. Uh, it's completely random. Uh, some technology that's useful uh, for surveys, of course, the uh, online networks, uh, web-based surveys, SurveyMonkey, uh, Facebook polls, uh, you name it, lots of options there. Uh, you, you've probably got gotten several of these before, so I don't really want to go and <laughs> spend a lot of time on this. You know, it's uh, very common. Uh, the last two, though, I kind of want to fixate on because those are the more interesting, I think. And this is the data mining and the analytics. So, again, the, the idea here is it's looking at people's behavior and observ observations, uh, what they do rather than just what they say they're doing. And it's it can yield some really interesting insights. Now, the problem with uh, data mining before, you know, back in the 70s, 80s, or even 90s, was there were the computers were too primitive to really do anything with this, you know, terabytes or whatever. <laughs> it's just tons and tons and tons of data. Now, obviously, you can't pay enough people to sift through all that and come to any reasonable conclusion. Uh, but now with all these com super advanced computers, they can mine this data. So they can go into this huge unbelievably huge databases like 
imagine the, the stuff Google uh, collects on you, the analytics. Uh, so the computer can rapidly, just in seconds, go through what it would take humans decades, if not <laughs> basically forever, uh, to go through. And they can, a lot of times, uh, they'll have data. And, and the computers are actually smart enough now where the, you can just give them the data and say, look, make some sense of this. <laughs> uh, you don't even ask specific questions, right? You just uh, give, you feed it all into the computer, and then it'll come back and say, look, here's some trends I've noticed. You know, and it might be something you never would have even thought about. Uh, you know, weird stuff. Uh, it's kind of, it almost seems like the computer, uh, not to get too far out, <laughs> uh, but sometimes it seems like the computer can even predict your behavior uh, just based on this huge accumulations of stuff. So they've got uh, drive through windows, for example, uh, where they've shown that uh, the computer can take a look at who's in the car, what type of vehicle it is, how many people are in the car, <laughs> the race, age, I don't know. And with uh, some degree of accuracy, predict what it is you're going to order uh, before you even roll up to that window, just based on this, again, huge piles of uh, data. Now, so it's in a way, it's a good thing. And of course, in another way, it's very scary. People don't like uh, their data being used like that without their knowledge. Uh, there's plenty of examples we can go into, but... I'll just leave it there for now. <laughs> you could take a, uh, my 403 class if you want to get more into those topics. All right, and then lastly, uh, citation and documentation. Uh, so in an academic paper, you're expected to use uh, MLA. Uh, so I can't draw. <laughs> anyway, MLA, APA, uh, Chicago, you name it. Uh, business, you probably won't do that. I don't, you might see a list of references something like that, but uh, usually it's enough just to have the uh, attribution there. Uh, so at the beginning, they would say something like, uh, this data comes from, I'll just write it out in plain English, right? This data comes from a study done in uh, 2016 by uh, Philip Morris. <laughs> you know, something like that. According to uh, Dr. Martin, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so it doesn't really, it's not like there's a formal citation mechanism there. It's just the important thing is you're not saying, look, this is my idea. You're showing, you're saying, you're pointing somebody out saying, this is where the idea comes from. This is where I got this information. And that's kind of important too. Not, it's not just, oh, look how smart this person is. Or look, look how diligent my research is. If uh, something happens later on and it, it turns out to be inaccurate or you've got errors in your report, uh, it's nice if you've attributed where those came from, especially if it's not you, uh, so that way you might dodge dodge a bullet. Uh, documentation, uh, you know, just where, bibliography, uh, bibliographic information. Uh, so if you have cited a bunch of studies, uh, people want to be able to verify that. Maybe they want to go back to the studies, take a look at it for themselves, uh, especially if I'm saying quoting survey results. So usually what you'll see, you'll, you'll see a table, you'll see the, uh, the graph there with the data on it. And somewhere at the bottom, it'll say source, Pew, Internet, blah, blah, blah. And that might be enough, or you might even go so far as to have a link there if it's, if it's on the web. And then they, all I have to do is click that little link, go straight to the study, and I can look at the, that original source myself. All right, so anyway, I hope all this has been useful to you. I'd love to hear your... <laughs> thoughts on surveys and if you've seen anything untrustworthy if you've been hoaxed yourself uh, those are always fun uh, but anyway i will uh end it here uh, please do let me know if you have questions or comments and thank you for watching